Rule number eight, learn to recognize expected outcomes. Now this is really interesting and in some ways you may be thinking, okay, but if you think about the type of questions you had in nursing school, usually something was wrong with the client and then you had to make a decision about what to do about it. On the NCLEX exam, remember they're trying to test your judgment and they do this in all sorts of ways and one of them is discriminating what's okay and discriminating what's not okay and doing something about it. So I think it's really important that you understand that on some of your questions everything's going to be fine and you don't have to make up a story in order to make something wrong. Let's look at this question. The healthcare provider ordered an arterial blood gas, ABG, for the client receiving oxygen at 6 liters per minute. Results show pH 7.37, HCO3 24 milliequivalents per liter, PaCO2 is 44 millimeters mercury, and PaO2 is 90 millimeters mercury. Which action by the nurse is most appropriate? Now those words most appropriate say to you what? That your discrimination is going to be required to answer this question about what topic? Now I assume it's going to be about the ABGs because I don't have anything else there in the stem, but I always like to look at my answer choices to confirm I have the right question. Number one, increase the client's rate of oxygen. That's about the ABGs elevate the head of the bed, getting it on um, respirations, document the results in the client's record, that's about the ABGs, or instruct the client to cough and deep breathe deeply. So again, all of these responses are about the ABGs. So the question is asking you, what is the most appropriate action for a client with these ABGs. Now I think when it comes to any lab value you can do this one of two ways. You can interpret the lab values as you are reading the stem of the question or you can wait to see your answers to decide which of the values do you need to interpret. I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way on that. You do what's comfortable for you. In this case, it's about the ABGs. The ABGs are all within normal limits. So the question is asking, what is the most appropriate nursing action for a client who has appropriate ABGs? Number one, do you increase the client's rate of oxygen? Well, there's no reason to because the PaO2 is fine. Now what I don't want you to do is say, good grief, the client's getting six liters per minute, how much do they need? You know, don't think that way. Just simply say, PaO2 is fine, we're going to eliminate that answer choice. Number two, elevate the head of the bed. Now when I've gone over this question with students, many times they'll, be, they'll kind of hesitate on this answer choice, thinking, well, it can't hurt anything, so we'll leave it in for consideration. Number three, document the results in the client's record. Yeah, you would do that if the ABGs are normal. Or number four, instruct the client to cough and deep breathe deeply. Now, that's kind of like number two. Well, can't hurt anything, I guess, but what is the most appropriate action for a client who has okay ABGs. These ABGs are within normal limits. There's no reason to increase the oxygen. There's no reason to elevate the head of the bed. There's no reason to instruct the client to cough and deep breathe. The correct response is document the results in the client's record. So this is an example of a question where everything's okay. You're recognizing that these are normal outcomes and it's appropriate and all I need to do is document. So don't be uncomfortable with these kinds of questions. But can you see how you might get sucked into a wrong answer because just thinking, well, something's got to be wrong here and if I can't identify what's wrong, I'll make up a story to make it wrong so you feel better basically about picking an incorrect response. So. Just know that, you know, not only are they testing do you recognize what's wrong, they also want you to recognize what is right. 
Rule number nine, you must be able to answer questions about positioning. Now, certainly you can sit down and you can memorize all sorts of positions and you can memorize under what circumstances these positions are used. But what I'm going to do now is give you a way that you can think through positioning questions so you don't have to memorize. I want you to use every opportunity in order to think through your questions, to engage in critical thinking. Always with positioning, you're trying to prevent something or promote something. So that's the first thing you think about. What am I trying to prevent or promote? Now, in order to answer it, you have to think about anatomy and physiology. And you also then need to determine which position, based on your answer choices and the question, best accomplishes the goal. Let's look at this question. The nurse administers a tube feeding to a client with decreased mental status. Immediately after completing the tube feeding, it is most important for the nurse to place the client in which position. Now those words most important say what to you? That your discrimination is required to answer the question. And we know what the topic is. It's what is the best position to place this client in immediately after a tube feeding. So, am I trying to prevent something or promote something? Well, I can go either way with it. When a client has tube feeding, I'm always concerned about aspiration. So I'm trying to prevent aspiration. I'm also concerned about the stomach emptying. So I want to put the patient in a position that will help empty the stomach. So those are my principles that I think about as I look at the answer choices. Number one, supine with the head of the bed elevated 45 degrees. So for those of you that are imagers, you think in pictures, think about how this patient is. They're sitting on their back with the head of the bed elevated 45 degrees. Now that's not all bad because that deals with preventing the aspiration. So that answer choice is okay. Number two, supine with the lower extremities elevated on pillows. So if you think about it, the client is lying flat and their legs are elevated. Well, what will the outcome be on that one? Well, that certainly sets the client up for aspiration, right? Because when you elevate the head of the legs, you're putting the pressure on the abdominal organs. Not a good thing. Don't like that answer choice. We're eliminating it. Number three, in high Fowler's position. Now, you know that's 60 to 90 degrees. So again, the patient sitting upright, that will prevent aspiration. I don't mind that answer choice. Or number four, on the right side with the head of the bed elevated. Hmm. So I have three answer choices here where the patient's basically elevated. So it must be this sideline position that really makes the difference between the answer choices. And do you like lying on the right side? And I do, because remember we're trying to promote emptying of the stomach. And so lying a patient on the right side will help promote emptying of the stomach. So in this particular case, I've met my need for promote, promote emptying of the stomach, and prevent. And that would be prevent aspiration. So therefore, the correct response is number four. Students who get into this positioning strategy really do like it. And like I said, it, it helps you think through things where you're not memorizing. And remember, back to rule number one, NCLEX is a test about judgment. You're always making a judgment. So the more you can be figuring out answers and thinking through them, the more you are engaged in that very behavior that National Council is testing on the NCLEX exam. Rule number 10, do not delegate assessment, teaching, or evaluation. All the way through the NCLEX examination, you're going to get these questions as a part of management of care, where they are going to in the stem of the question give you, you know, this is the makeup of the nursing team, and then ask a question, which patient is most appropriate to assign to the LPN, LVN, and then you have to select the patient. 
Well, we're going to go over this more in class. I just want to share with you here that the RN can never delegate assessment, teaching, or evaluation to an LP and LVN or to a nursing assistant. So what I want you to do is go through your answer choices and ask yourself, does this patient require assessment? Do they require teaching? Do they require evaluation? If they require one of those things, then the patient needs to stay with the RN. Now, one of the things that you need to be really careful about is that assessment piece. I find that people who aren't very discriminating and aren't really thinking through their answer choices will make everything an assessment. You know, for example, you've got a patient who's just been in surgery and they've been released back to the floor and the somebody is admitting this client to the floor. Well, that very first blood pressure and assessment should be done by the RN because that is an unstable patient. So, you know, think about your activities, especially assessment, and decide why are you doing it. And if you're doing it because the patient's unstable, by all means, you cannot delegate it. But sometimes, you know, the, the healthcare provider will write, obtain blood pressure, you know, QID, four times a day. Well, taking that blood pressure is just following an order and that certainly could be delegated to either the LP and LVN or to the nursing assistant. So do not delegate assessment, teaching, or evaluation.